Thank you, Gernot, for sharing your thoughts about future Mars exploration. And But that's not all. We are continuing the topic. And uh, uh, Gernot would stay here. Uh, and let me invite you uh, on a stage, uh, uh, Professor Thais uh, Rusomano from Innova Space, uh, and um, Dr. Joanna Jurga from Design Lab, uh, Dr. Anna Wosiak, uh, the geologist, uh, and Lesha Gorzakowski from Lunares and Spaces More. And we will have also two, I believe, uh, uh, two participants online that will join us online. Uh, Romain Fontaine from Foresight Institute and uh, European Space Agency, and Nicolas Peter uh, from International Space University. And we will discuss the topic of living in a Martian city. Okay, so let me start maybe with your connection to Mars. I mean, every of you is somehow connected to, to, to Mars. Uh, well, you haven't been there, I, I guess. <laughs> but part of you uh, somehow uh, were in the forms of ana analog astronauts. But uh, how come that uh, you are Mars connected? So maybe we'll start with uh, uh, with, with you, Tai. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Thais Russomano. I'm a medical doctor. So I think that's a very important area for Mars explore exploration. Uh, and uh, my areas of expertise is uh, uh, space medicine, space physiology, aviation medicine, and digital health. So um, um, I'm a, uh, an academic and also a businesswoman now with a company called Innova Space. And uh, I want to, to contribute somehow with my knowledge to this uh, debate, as I believe that, uh, as it was shown by my dear friend Gernot, we are on Mars with rovers, you know, we are exploring Mars, but the problem to get there, unfortunately, <laughs> relies on my area of expertise, which is how to take humans to Mars safely and um, you know, allow them to work there, live there, and one day maybe come back safe to Earth. So this is the, the main challenge. The human body is extremely complex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. So, uh, well, Gernot, we already heard uh, a bit more about yourself, but maybe you want to add something? Well, you were asking about the connection to Mars. Why, why, we, why we're doing this? Why, why, why climb a mountain? Yeah? Uh, there's a famous quote from Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, the first uh, climber of Mount Everest. Uh, and when he was asked why would you, why would you do this, he said because it's there, and so we are standing on the shoulders of giants of Sir Isaac Newton, of Nicholas Copernicus, who enabled us to find how to do the orbital calculations and how to propel ourselves through space or so, and we are the first generation where Mars is just about to be at the reach of our hands. And so I feel, I don't know how you feel about this, I feel an obligation to do so, because I, I couldn't stand if my little son would ask me in 30 years from now, Mars was just across the, 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 the door, why, why didn't you do it? And I, would, I couldn't stand to say, well, I'm sorry, we, we had other problems or some other excuses. So it's, it's a logical continuation of feeding and nourishing that nomadic gene part that is within us as humans. So hello, my name is Jana Jurga and I'm interior and product designer and I focus on sense of security in space. So I, I work on it, how to design the habitat inside. So not only this harsh engineering part, but also this more human touch. So how we can do it this way to help our psychology to stay safety in this far away from home space on Mars. So this is what I do, and I also was twice the commander of the mission in Lunaris Space Habitat. So we know each other already a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can switch to the online guests, if you don't mind, Anna and Leszek. So uh, maybe we can start with, uh, with <laughs> Romain. Could you, could you say a few words about yourself and your connection to Mars? OK, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, Hello, so my name is Romain. I'm a space engineer from France. I work at the European Space Agency on the ExoMars program. Uh, so I'm basically preparing the operations for the rover that will go to Mars well now, in a few years from now, instead of this year. So I'm working along with the scientists and also engineers to make sure that the rover will, will operate very well 
and uh, in terms of uh, well, engineering aspects, operations on ground, also in terms of uh, scientific results to, that we want to have. Uh, well, prior to that, I also worked on MSL, the Curiosity Rover at NASA. And I'm also one of the leaders on the project of the Foresight Institute that tries to bridge the gaps between uh, the technologies that we have in many different fields. So, of course, space, the one that I'm leading, but also, for example, neural technologies and uh, longevity that will be also extremely important for space exploration in the future. Thank you very much. So, uh, Nicolas, could you join us? So, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from the um, International Space University that is based in Strasbourg, France. That is the um, sole university dedicated to uh, space education around the world. So, uh, no better place than to discuss about uh, the topic of today, which is uh, Mars exploration. I must admit, I do come from a different angle compared to the, my fellow panelists and peers. Um, I do come more with a policy background and uh, international relations dimension. And in that context, for me, Mars is very important. Because if you recall, uh, we are at the beginning of a new century. Uh, but if you recall the past century, most of the history books, whatever you take it, uh, which irrespective of, of the country or the language, most likely it has a picture of uh, uh, a US flag on the moon as being one of the defining moments of the past uh, century, the one that showed for the first time uh, us setting the foot on a different uh, body in a solar system. And I really do believe that uh, Mars is in, uh, is, would be one of those uh, destinations in, in this upcoming century. And uh, having the first picture of uh, having a human on Mars will be one of these moments that will really unite everyone. And for the one having the boots on the ground uh, will really make also a difference in terms of policy and international relations as well. Thank you. We get back to the stage. Anna. Hi, uh, I'm Anya, uh, and I'm a geologist. Um, <laughs> the, what's most important uh, for me uh, when I'm doing uh, planetary geology, this is why I decided to do planetary geology, is because we cannot really understand uh, our own planet or how the processes, geological processes, are shaping uh, our, you know, the body that, that we people live on right now if we don't understand how the same processes or similar processes work on other uh, planets. Like if we are trying to, uh, you know, put a line uh, and we have to put a line through just one point, one point of reference, which is our own hair uh, on, on uh, Earth, there is a lot of uncertainty because we don't have a, a reference point to test our hypothesis. So this is why uh, studying uh, other planetary bodies, including uh, Mars in great detail, is so important uh, for, for science, for geology, for astrobiology. Uh, this is the only way we can really understand our own home and our own life uh, if we go uh, and look at it from a distance, uh, a distance from a red planet. Thank you, Leszek. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Leszek Orzechowski. I'm an architect. Uh, a few years ago, I guess I mentioned that to Milena that I had this problem whether I should study astronomy or architecture, and I went for architecture. Uh, so after uh, I graduated, I decided to become a space architect. And we uh, created a, a small group called Space is More, uh, where we were designing different uh, analog habitats or uh, space uh, habitats, or even all whole colonies. Uh, and there were like um, several international competitions that we've won, but eventually we decided to uh, create our own uh, analog habitat, the, similar to what Gernot is doing during his missions, for, in order for us to study it a little bit more, and also <coughs> to gather more data for uh, researchers, uh, scientists, uh, medical doctors. Um, so yeah, uh, we are trying to um, test our uh, designs and using analog conditions. 
Thank you. Well, that's really a wide uh, range of uh, competences and uh, interests that you, you, you have here and, and really present here. So I hope for a really fruitful discussion. And uh, maybe let's start with the, we already uh, talked a bit about challenges. Well, you, you, you mentioned that from the medical point of view. Uh, so when you think about, well, all of you in, in, in your, let's say, uh, area of interest, when you think about the biggest challenges uh, in terms of uh, getting to Mars, surviving on Mars, and colonizing Mars or living on Mars, uh, what would you pick? Uh, what's the biggest challenge in your opinion? I feel that there are, in terms of uh, you know, the, the aspects related to health of the astronauts during the mission, I think that there are three main areas, not restricted to that, but three main areas, which would be the gravitational change. You know, and I say that because you are going to take, let's say, X, X number of months to get to Mars in microgravity conditions, and then we have to stay there in hypogravity conditions, and then back, you know, if possible, <laughs> in microgravity conditions again. So we have uh, uh, then this gravitational, let's say, challenge. We have uh, radiation, you know, and uh, for the first time uh, after the moon, you no, know, but going further in this case, we are going to be exposed to the radiation of space, which is um, going to damage the body of the astronauts, uh, for sure. And there is another aspect that I think that's very important which is the um, psycho, I would call it psychosocial aspects of a space mission. Because we are gonna have um, supposedly men and women, you know, four men, uh, uh, two men, two women, or whatever the crew is going to be designed, but about four people traveling together in a very confined and isolated environment. So this is going to be very challenging. Uh, we are all humans after all. <laughs> and when we are together, you know, especially in a stressful situation, we, try, we have the possibility at least to, um, to, to act a bit awkward. Plus all this challenge that people will be suffering during the mission. And, um, and on top of that, you know, it is uh, uh, if we, how we, another issue, let's say, uh, not related to the mission itself, the astronauts traveling, but how could we as doctors or, or scientists help the astronauts during the mission? Uh, normally we use um, digital health, telemedicine, you know, for the, 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 the astronauts that are orbiting the Earth. And to go to the moon, it's not that uh, problem because the moon is roughly 300,000 kilometers from Earth. And then um, if there is a delay in the communication, it'll be one to two seconds in terms of um, you know, the communication going the, at the speed of light. But when you are on Mars, uh, we know that it's going to range from at least three minutes uh, each way and up to 22, 24 minutes each way, which is um, it's not ideal. No? It can, we can still manage some clinical situations, but for sure in an emergency, in an accident, it's not going to be very helpful. So we, are, we need to have this crew uh, very autonomous in terms of health. The, um, uh, understanding you know, of what is happening to them and also to have some skills to treat, especially medical emergencies. And then for that, for sure, you will need uh, very sophisticated um, artificial intelligence softwares and uh, hardware in terms of maybe a robot. Uh, we don't need a robot, could be just a computer, but you know, they're just to have the image of someone, <laughs> maybe the white coat <laughs> on, might help psychologically the astronauts as well. So I think that, as I said in my introduction, uh, we had uh, since Gagarin, you know, 61 years of um, humans in space, we learned a lot for sure. We could have learned more in many aspects, in my opinion, but uh, uh, what I think that is very crucial now is that we know enough to know that we don't know enough. <laughs> and this is, uh, uh, it's very challenging, you know, uh, in terms of architecture and other aspects uh, that also affect humans in, in, in their missions. I think that was a pity that after 1972, so for 50 years, we left the moon. We could have learned so much about mm -hmm. Living the well-being of people working and living in, a, you know, in another celestial body, uh, it would have, in my opinion, it was really a, a huge uh, loss for us. Uh, in, in, not just in terms of medicine, of course, but especially now that we want to go to Mars and we, we don't have the experience 
we don't know how to do it properly. No, uh, I mean, men um, uh, trips with humans. No, not of course. It was shown before rovers and so on. We are on Mars, so we know how to get there. We know enough about Mars to uh, to deal with, except that humans are very complex and we don't know enough. Any of you want to add some more shoes? So yeah, maybe you will ask our colleagues. Uh, on one side, so maybe uh, Romain, in terms of let's say uh, uh, technology, so are we now prepared for getting to Mars and for landing on Mars with the, well, with people, with astronauts, or what do we need? What shall we face to uh, to to do it? I, I think that landing a rover on Mars is very different than landing a crew. Uh, because for now, landing a rover, well, we use parachutes, right, first, and then maybe a retro rocket, like it was the case, for example, for uh, Perseverance, or like it will be the case maybe for ExoMars. Uh, but, you know, when landing a crew, it will be much more, much heavier, like maybe several tons. And so the, the thin atmosphere of Mars uh, may make it difficult to land using parachutes at first. So maybe we'll have to get rid of that and use only retro rockets. So brand new technologies, innovative technologies, to make sure that we land safely on Mars uh, without harming astronauts, but also without damaging equipment, uh, instruments as well, or uh, anything uh, inside, uh, let's say, the, the capsule. Uh, well, another aspect that I believe shall be tackled is the, the radiation problem. Um, we know that the astronauts have a threshold not to go through during their career in terms of radiation in uh, sieverts. Uh, well, I'm not an expert in medicine, of course, but uh, so um, maybe we'll have to find some new materials, new technology to make sure that they are safe from having cancers or uh, just dying while going to Mars or while being on Mars for maybe a couple of years. So that will be a, a very big challenge, I believe. And also in terms of in-situ resource utilization. For now, we have a MOXIE on Perseverance that creates about 6 to 10 grams an hour of oxygen. Uh, well, of course, there is a goal to make it, let's say, uh, sizable for uh, a crew. Uh, but I think we are not there yet. And uh, missions to the moon to make sure that the technologies are being well designed, you know, to make sure that they are sophisticated enough, uh, will be a stepping stone uh, for, make sure, for, for making sure that astronauts will be safe uh, once we are on Mars. So uh, let's assume that we we solve the problem of uh, uh, medical aspects and also the technological aspects and we already landed on Mars and wanted to settle a colony there uh, or build something there. So what shall we do? I mean, are on-site resources uh, something that is enough? What do we need to bring with us? So what shall we start with? Uh, does any of you have any ideas or thoughts? Hmm. Well, uh, it really, like, the answer will be very different if we are talking about very first missions, that is the scientific missions where you need to establish a small habitat, and this is shelter. Uh, a, a shelter, basically. And, uh, or we are talking about a bigger community. Um, we can think about what we are seeing, for example, in, in, in Arctic regions. We can think about McMurdo Base, where you see that there is a place in Arctic that where thousands of people are living, but it's not called a city or it's not uh, because officially due to uh, some legislation, you cannot, uh, you cannot um, colonize Arctic, uh, but probably you will see something maybe similar uh, to those bases on the moon and Mars. So, and they will create this community, but how to build something that big? You cannot bring everything from Earth. You probably need to work with in-situ resources. So you need to learn how to uh, get your raw materials uh, on Mars, how to uh, create your own shelters. Uh, first, probably it will be very simple uh, aspect of uh, trying to use regol uh, regolith to, to maybe 3D print a road, maybe a small shelter in, in where you can inflate your habitat that you bring with you uh, inside to just have some, some radiation uh, protection some, uh, and protection from, uh, from uh, the, uh, well, 
the environment that, that literally wants to kill you. But uh, once you learn how to do it, uh, you will uh, you will be living in a confined space where you need to where and you cannot go outside without your spacesuit. You need to uh, live in a sustainable way. Uh, you need to get, you need to. Uh, uh, um, organize your way, survive and organize your waste uh, very well. So you need technologies that, in fact, we need on Earth now for our uh, climate challenges. Uh, so, in order to build something on Moon on Mars, you also need to develop technologies that will help uh, communities here on Earth. Um, but yeah, but if you want to colonize Mars, you need to be able to create. Uh, your technology, your civilization, your habitats with the materials you find there. So bringing everything there, like your 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 robots, your factories, will be a, a real challenge here. And the good news is that uh, Mars has everything that Earth has. Uh, maybe um, most of the ores are not so easy to get to because there is much less geological processing, uh, which means that the uh, the division of a certain uh, um, certain atoms that, that we uh, want was not as efficient as on Earth. However, if we put enough energy into this process, we are, you know, able to get uh, titanium, iridium, uh, plenty of oxygen, whatever we want, we can get it from Mars. So uh, it's, not the, uh, it's not the problem of uh, the um, accessibility of, of the raw materials, it's the problem of technological processing uh, of them in the most efficient way. Uh, and we don't know this way, unfortunately, because we are quite uh, familiar with uh, doing uh, mining on Earth, uh, but on Mars, it will be done in slightly it has to be done in a slightly different way. So we need to learn that. But it's not impossible. So that's a good news. But I still think that, uh, as one of the astronauts say, they promise us Mars and we get fa Facebook. So in the way which is most important, that is our psychology. And the way that we have to survive as these four people on the beginning to flying there and not kill each other, and then survive there in this small shelter in the way that we don't know when and if we come back. So like from my point of view, this way and the whole knowledge we can, which we can take now from the isolation on Arctic North or South Pole is the one of the most important because as we know the technology can survive. We as the human beings are much more complex. So we should focus on that how to training and how to support people not only robots and computers to to do, the, do that as pos as good as possible. And when you add more people, it's getting even more complicated because there are different needs that that uh, a larger group uh, is seeking for. Not only your small team, but when you have society, there you're getting a, a lot of larger problems of finding your mate, find uh, being able to. Uh, work, being able to be useful. Uh, so, yeah, getting a, a healthy society is super uh, difficult there. Especially that we have already this history of building the new societies and not always they work well. <laughs> well, that's where policy comes in, I guess, yeah, Nicolas. Exactly. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I find the discussion very fascinating, but I think uh, for me, the biggest challenge has nothing to do with science nor technology. It's really back on earth is which leader will have the courage to engage into a, a mission that is, uh, even though we know the results is gonna be uh, groundbreaking, to get the decision to engage us to go to Mars uh, in most likely an a mandate that will go beyond this political term. Are we gonna be able to engage society over the distance to commit for the resources uh, how are we going to engage society to make sure that in case of risks, there is not an issue that we should not stop? So all of these issues are very important. So for me, we, we, have, we are building in Europe and around the world in cooperation all the necessary building blocks, being in technology, uh, being in, in the scientific knowledge, what can, you know, how will the body react, can we do it, can we adapt? But we need to work into the, uh, this dimension of uh, political dimension, and that's why I think the European Space Agency, with the, the Space Summit uh, they did in, in Toulouse in uh, earlier this year, and uh, 
next year that will be in, in Madrid. It's very important to be able to mobilize this high level political decision, you know, these decision makers to give the mandate to the agencies, uh, being it ESA, being national agency, to say, okay, let's work together. Let's set collectively our aim to go to moon, to Mars, to make sure that we, we can we can do that for the society because we need to to spark the light in, in, in the whole society. Because if we say space is hard, we are losing a, a big part of the society, but space is inclusive. We should say there's room for everyone, space is big, but also that uh, we need everyone. Everyone has his chance, but for that we need first and foremost the political masters, decision makers, budget authority, financial committee, financial committee in every country, in parliament to be involved as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So, but since we already talked about like, let's say different types of people and as bigger group, the bigger number of problems and so on, so on. For those of you who were involved in analog missions and we know uh, quite a few of, of, of you did. So what, what have we learned from this kind of uh, missions? Let's maybe start first with the, if I may uh, suggest, uh, what kind of people we, we need uh, what are the, the most well, uh, important things that we shall have? I, I think the, the, the selection process for the crews for Mars and to some extent to the analog astronauts as well has evolved tremendously in the last uh, few years. You know, we, we used to start with the rocket jockeys from the 70s of the astronauts walking in slow motion with the helmet under the arm and heroic music in the background <laughs> to the to the rocket. Uh, more into team players, we call them the, the beta two personalities, people who know which are very healthy, who have technical competence, but it's the people who you want to have an after work beer because they have some nice stories to share. Yeah, the guys who are able and the, and, the, and the women who are able to tell a joke in the airlock spontaneously just release the tension a little bit. Yeah? Because otherwise I can tell you, if you don't take very carefully selection into your consideration, people will start to scream and shout at each other before you left lunar orbit. <laughs> um, on the opposite, of course, it also bears challenges and, and, and promises. What if you send six people to Mars and seven want to return? Huh? So, so there will be surprises <laughs> on the way, huh? for sure. So, so what I'm saying is it's all about the people, uh, right from before we even start a mission to Mars until we have a full settlement of Mars. That's how policy comes in. So let's be honest. We're living here in a bubble here. We're all in favor of going to Mars. But that's not the majority of the population outside. They either don't have an opinion or see it as a waste of, a waste of money. But if we can convince them incrementally that there are benefits to the European citizens, and there is, I, it's, it's not an empty promise, we, we see science generating benefits in analog research already now. Let me give you one example and then pass on the mic. Uh, we all experienced COVID. Many of us, I would say the majority, had to go into some sort of quarantine in the high phase of the, of the, of, uh, um, of the challenging uh, global problem. And we all had the challenge of, okay, the first day you think about cleaning your environment, like clean the windows and then do some painting. I know how many walls have been painted through COVID throughout worldwide. Um, and after 30, you say, okay, how am I gonna spend the rest of the day? And that's the very same thing that kicks in if the space newness factor wears off on the voyage from Mars or if in a long duration isolation mission. So the studies that were done years ago already about isolation missions, all the recommendations that came out of this, like keep a regular daily schedule. Don't neglect your social contacts. Reward yourself for an accomplishment you can do. All those things come from analog research, and we have evidence for that. So we have already the first spin-off, if you want it or not, the first, first spin-off of analog research into a COVID structuring society. Uh, not a lot of people know that, but it's in the papers. Uh, so we're getting there. And once we realize that Mars is only not only catalyzing innovation, which is the natural resource we have in Europe we need to capitalize on, and that there are materials on Mars worth for Earth, that there is tourism kicking in at one point, maybe not to Mars first, first low Earth orbit and then the Moon and then one day to Mars or so. So incrementally there are incentives that might justify a societal uh, engagement. We should not focus on sending six people on the ground on Mars, put the flag in and disappear again into the nothingness of history, but have it sustainable 
responsible, always having the benefits of society in, in, in our, on our radar, and that will get us to Mars. So I, I can completely agree with you because that was in fact my uh, PhD thesis. So <laughs> how we can bring the knowledge from uh, from habitat to the daily life? This is what COVID gives me. So yes, that's uh, that's true. But I also have this feeling that uh, we have to inspire it. So we have to open for people outside our bubbles, and we have to talk about it. And uh, this is, I think, so the last question we have. It's funny because I just think about it. That what uh, sci-fi gives us is this ex exactly the same story like if we will talk with the people outside our bubble and educate as much as we can that is not only some group of the crazy people who would like to play on mars and we are not only going there to gig digging and it's not about only for profit for some company that will be a chance that we will go there in the way maybe not we but our kids will go um and the question also was about those difficulties and but and so we talk about people and their surroundings this is your PhD um, but also the conditions for example on our analog missions oh but and by the way get is 100% right uh, in 2021 Polish Ministry of Health gave a patronage to lunar suicide station uh, as a, for the contribution of uh, uh, COVID research so that's really true uh, and also in our case uh, but when it comes to uh, challenges, you're, you are what you eat. And you, if your food is awful, you will start arguing, regardless if you are a superhuman that can work very well. So um, you can train people very well. But if you are not prepared for the mission and you are having, uh, and people are not enjoying their surroundings or what they eat, or uh, it could also be uh, lead to mission failure. So uh, from our um, experiences um, a lot of uh, arguing started with bad food uh, in fact inside uh, inside crews in fact and coffee and coffee we and need lack coffee of, lack like of, lack the of one of coffee. our experiment was to do the analog mission without coffee oh. yes <laughs> and that was really really awful like the mission was great but uh, they take from us coffee and chocolate and uh, that was quite difficult for some of the people <laughs> and because of the food in around 30 yeah. percent of the crews that we selected we had some kind of arguments yeah. uh, but that was a very important uh, important uh, Knowledge. knowledge to get yeah. <laughs> yeah but also like we don't we really need to take care of the people who we close in this kind of condition like this is exactly what God said that we need the specific conditions even the light of the temperature of the air can change the level of the cortisol and the way how the people behave so we already have the paper for all this knowledge and it will be really nice if we start to use it also in different uh, also in our houses, maybe and yeah. flats and houses. And yeah, houses is a good hospitals. Yeah, army. Like there are plenty of places when we can help people in the way what we already know from the isolation mission. Uh, in terms of um, uh, let's say medical selection, you know, I think that it is very easy to select someone physically. You know that is healthy. You have lots of tests that you can run and oh, this person is healthy enough. I think that we are, we are discussing, in fact, is how um, we can select a group of people, a small group of people that are psychologically fit for this type of mission. Uh, I think <laughs> that if you go for, let's say, four people, that we should use four people that, I don't know if you are familiar with this term, but it is they call transients. Transients are not people that live in one place or immigrate to another place. It's people, uh, people that, for professional or personal reasons, they travel a lot. So I think that if you travel a lot, you are, uh, by definition, more flexible. You are less judgmental. You don't think that your own culture or language or religion, whatever, is, uh, is the only one or the best one. So I think transient people would be very nice. Secondly, I think that we should go for a family. So a father, a mother, and um, uh, maybe uh, two boys or two girls, no, not boys, I mean grown-ups, no, but uh, two men, two, 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 two women, because I think that it would avoid lots of psychological problems uh, if this family is united enough here on Earth. And I think that this family should go 
a transient family. No, there are many uh, that I know, <laughs> but in any case, that can go to uh, to orbit first and experience microgravity there and do some tasks and work together. And then this same family go to the moon and spend a week on the moon, for example, whatever, uh, living in a, in a different environment. <coughs> I think that uh, this would be the best way to really select psychologically. So it's a healthy family, so four people, health enough in terms of uh, physically health. And then uh, this aspect of um, uh, like competition or, or, uh, or even um, uh, someone being born in space <laughs> or things like that would be uh, less, uh, you know, the disputes, are, it would be less uh, likely to happen. It's not impossible, you know, but it is uh, uh, less likely. These people will know each other. These people would have experienced microgravity. These people would experience hypogravity on the moon. They know how to deal with many aspects. They are transient, so they are, in fact, more open, more flexible. Um, and it goes, going back in time, I'm old enough to say that one of my preferred series on TV was Lost in Space, which was a family, the no? The Robinson. <laughs> they, uh, and it worked very well, no? It, uh, and it was always in my mind that for some, of course, that's a series on TV and it has to attract the public, you know, the ch children especially. But in any case, I think that four people, four, a, a family, a transient family and a robot would be a possibility. Just to add as a footnote this, or you could also consider going couples, couples who have been working and living together for, for many years or so. Yeah, the um, problem that comes sometimes is <laughs> like the other couples. I know, there, there, <laughs> there's a funny note on this. I've been talking with Cheryl Bishop, uh, who is a very famous American uh, space psychologist, and she said, well, we should send three couples, or I, I suggest to her we should send three couples tomorrow, six people, three couples. And she said, yeah, that's a good idea, Gannot. And I'm sure they're going to be three couples returning, but not the same three couples <laughs> that went there. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something that we need to be concerned about sometimes and can create... As with, uh, I'm just using the example of ABBA, but it was a real problem for them, you know, when they had this um, uh, exchange of, of couples. And, uh, and I think that it is, uh, uh, we need to, to decrease the stress and you need to work properly together. So uh, that's my idea. So it is just uh, for us to debate. And uh, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just saying that it might be a possibility. But for transient people, independently of being a family or not, transient people are the best choice, I believe, for things like that. I can uh, suggest another uh, great choice for uh, future astronauts because they are transient people very often and also um, tested out in very unexpected and hard conditions where it's crucial to work together. Otherwise, outcomes can be literally deadly. <laughs> and I'm talking about field geologists. Haha. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, there are, of course, different levels of doing field geology uh, where you are going either just in your own country and uh, spending, you know, a couple of days, maybe in the tent or maybe not, uh, or you can be doing field geology in Antarctica, uh, where you are uh, just in the white uh, nothingness uh, for months and there is literally no one to help you in case you break your leg because there may be, uh, you know, you, you are literally cut off from the uh, environment. Uh, and then uh, like experiences that were maybe not put into papers yet, even though they probably should, uh, where, for example, that uh, in the very beginning, those missions uh, that uh, were, for example, to collect uh, meteorites uh, from the ice in Antarctica, uh, were taking all of those uh, uh, alpha males, uh, something that uh, Gernot mentioned previously. And it uh, very often it, it was leading to very dangerous situations because they were uh, getting bored very quickly. They were trying to show off uh, between themselves and uh, there were fights and a lot of testosterone floating all the time. Very unhealthy situation. Right now, uh, a lot of the uh, like the, the missions are much better designed because people are selected better. Uh, they are selecting uh, people that can work uh, in, um, well, 
sometimes boring situations because very often most of the time you, you spend you spend on waiting until for example weather will be good uh, or on doing boring stuff that needs to be done but but it's very important to do it well but it's still boring uh and I would like to say that a lot of those uh, people that are now selected to, to run it better are women. So maybe we need women field geologists in space. <laughs> <laughs> but I think so we need them everywhere. Any candidate? <laughs> <laughs> But this is why exactly they start sending women on the Polish North Pole Station. So we also have some uh, some papers about that. And it's also always also the quote that the Arctic is the place when we create a lot of worst poetry and art around the world because people are so bored waiting for the things to do. So, uh, yes. <laughs> We need to know how to survive when we are really boring in this kind of conditions. But but then you also need to be um, able to work uh, once really hard and second uh, under a lot of pressure in case something happens. And you need to do this like full range of different things uh, at the same time being one person. And this is very hard to And I find. think it will be true both for the first scientific missions and for living in a city with others because Mars will always uh, will try to kill you. Um, Okay, so uh, let's assume that we have uh, policy makers that make it possible and give green light for, for going to Mars, that we have all technology needed, that we have uh, medical challenges uh, overcome, and, uh, and we have a crew that is selected, and it's a good crew, let's say, to be selected. We go to the Mars, where shall we land? Like, uh, where the first mission shall land? And this is the question, actually, that has at least two aspects. One is uh, from technological point of view. So what are the locations already maybe like discussed uh, that are kind of uh, safe uh, from, the, uh, from the technology point of view that we can safely land there uh, and our machines will not get broken and so on, so on and also from the geological point of view so which are of the of the biggest let's say value uh, for us as humans from geological point of view well first of all we need quite a lot of water uh, because all of other things can be gathered uh, easier but uh, we should probably land if we want to sustain a sizable um, number of people i'm not saying about those first um, um, First missions where there will be just a couple of people, maybe 20, maybe 30. Uh, there should be enough uh, water in the regolith to, to provide uh, needs for, for, the, um, for the small outpost. However, if we want to have something larger, like, like a small city on Mars, we need to have a sustainable large uh, source of water. And this is, of course, slightly problematic because water tends to be more to the north or there's more water uh, below the ground uh, as ice uh, in the northern and southern parts uh, close to the um, close to the poles however uh, we want to land where it's not that cold and that there's a lot of sunlight so we still want to be in the uh, equatorial part so i think that if i would be to you know, select a location or to guess where it will be. It will be probably somewhere close to the uh, Valles Marineris because it uh, provides kind of both of those um, good things that we can get in one place. When it comes to the landing sites, uh, I think equatorial regions have to be just because of orbital mechanics considerations. But there's great places to be, not only for the water, but also for the caves. Uh, because if you look into lava tubes, and they can be quite stable on Mars, as we know, um, they could be a place where you have uh, thermal stability, where you have protection from radiation. Um, and so I think uh, considering, maybe for not for the first landing, but for future establishing a settlement or so, underground, uh, at least the place where people sleep overnight or stay over extended periods before they venture outside, might be a good idea. So I, I have that, that romantic motion, notion that, uh, well, if you think, think of uh, uh, the first societies on Earth that really went into a place where we can still re-enact or relive their experiences 
10,000 years afterwards were caves on Earth. And we now see the cave paintings 10,000 years afterwards. So what if we dwell into caves on Mars as well, and 10,000 years from now, somebody, something's going to discover cave paintings of the first humans on Mars? Well, and to, so, well, no, objection. Yes. <laughs> I'm not so sure about, well, I'm not saying it's, it's impossible, but I think that people, if they could uh, find better shelter, they, they were looking for shelters outside and caves were very often used as uh, kind of special locations where they were going for more uh, fancy religious or other um, reasons than Caves are not so great to live in, uh, and especially. And also, I think that on Mars they they won't be perfect because we cannot really control how stable they are. We cannot really check uh, and and uh, create the the shape, size, whatever that that we really want. So I think that uh, from the pragmatic point of view, even though you know I love caves, especially lava tubes, okay. awesome. <coughs> but from the pragmatic point of view, I would, if I were. Uh, future Martian person, I would prefer to live in a, like a regolith cover shelter. That sounds much safer. So, sorry, sorry to stop this uh, very interesting part of discussion here, although uh, we are running out of time and we still would like to know a bit more from, from our experts. And uh, maybe, uh, Nicolas, could you comment on, uh, on the legal uh, and political challenges? Although, uh, can we land wherever we want? Uh, how shall we deal with that? Uh, what about also ethical aspects? So those are very, very important questions and that we really need to, uh, to be able to address. So um, uh, the, the current legal system uh, has been developed in the, in the 60s and, and in the 70s, uh, at the same time that uh, the first step in the space exploration uh, era started. Um, you look at the major of UN five, uh, five UN treaties, they were more or less developed at the same time as the, um, the main, the major step in space exploration and human spaceflight in particular were developed. So now if you want, to, and, and those are very still relevant today, but if we talk about going to Mars, um, the, the, for a scientific reason, the, the legal uh, structure is in place to, to put a boundary, to, to put a framework. However, if you want to go into uh, settlement or colonization, as I've heard, there we have to be um, careful because certain things are not yet fully uh, regulated uh, and not agreed upon in, in the community. So that's something we need to really to be, uh, to be mindful of. Uh, and, and we will have already future cases on the moon whereby uh, resources that will be utilized but they will not be owned by anyone. So that, that's most likely we will not have the time to discuss about it today, but that's in its own right can be something very particular. Uh, and also in the current uh, international context, you can imagine that for instance, coming up with a new agreement, if needed, gonna be very difficult. Uh, that's why there's also an evolution from more hard law to soft law to more technical guidelines where you have different, um, I would say, guide, not guidelines, but different elements that are put forward that would be need, that are important to be followed, but there are no, no enforcement. And if we talk about Mars exploration, what happens if we do something that is inappropriate, there's no enforcement mechanism, and that's, gonna, that's a current weakness in the system. Also, in terms of uh, scientific contamination, COSPAR, the Committee uh, on, the, on Space Research, is very active into looking at uh, make sure that we avoid um, forward contamination and, and backward contamination. That means contamination by uh, by Earth uh, microbes, put it in a way, and and Mars microbe in the other direction. And that's something very important because uh, if there is life on Mars, and I hope we will be able to find that there is life on Mars, we make sure as well that we protect it and we don't do necessarily as we've done or what we are doing with our ecosystem on Earth, that right now we are not the best uh, species to do a stewardship uh, on, on planet Earth. So I hope we will also be able to think about it before we really set uh, on a sustainable manner uh, foot on, on Mars. Thank you. 
So maybe now I will follow with a with a with a question to the agency, let's say insiders or remain. When will the humans will walk, walk on Mars? So what are the next next steps actually of our Mars explorations? And what is your guess? Oof. Or your knowledge? <laughs> that's uh, I, I guess that's hard to make. <laughs> Because we always have some problems that we cannot consider. For example, COVID-19 is a real example of a, an issue that we had worldwide that impacted the space exploration programs as well. For example, the ExoMars uh, mission was already delayed from 2020 to 2022. And uh, also SLS has many problems and still delayed uh, from uh, September to the end of this month. So uh, we have a lot of problems that we need to to assess that can be known or not. Um, and this will depend on how many times we go to the moon and when do we go to the moon uh, for, a, let's say, a kind of independent uh, settlement. I guess this will be the, the baseline for having a settlement on Mars. So let's say if I'm optimistic, I hope to see at least first people going to Mars by 2040. Uh, having great technology for that. And maybe for settlement, I, I hope it will be well before my retirement, maybe even by 2060, hopefully. So uh, just like a sum up, maybe question for all of you, if you could, we can just make a, a, a round table and uh, internet table, let's say, <laughs> a round. Uh, when you started to work on Mars-related topic, or in general, space-related topic, what was the biggest surprise for you? What is something that really strikes you as a thing that, that is cosmic, <laughs> in a sense? I don't know who wants to be first with that. So. I was surprised that there are people that we can already call Martians, because they are dedicated their life to uh, put those people on the red planet and really they, are, they have a, a big dedication to this other world that no one yet visited. So, and they are creating this culture that you can really experience. Uh, so in some sense, you can already meet, meet some Martians uh, because they are mentally already living there. Mm -hmm. So anyone else? I had a personal experience uh, on my first mission at the Mars Desert Research Station back in 2003, so it was many years ago, when we had uh, the chance of doing a nighttime extra vehicle activity, aka spacewalk, which is a rather rare, rare thing because of safety considerations, but we're able to do this. So four of us would venture out to stay in the station. And uh, when you are in, in the spacesuit, um, in the desert at night, you see the brilliant night sky above you and the you know, all the lights pinned up in the sky. The difference to doing this without the spacesuit is that the stars are not pinpointed far away on the firmament, but they're literally projected on the visor of your spacesuit helmet. They are about 10 centimeters from your nose, which means you are taking literally a bath in the middle of the stars. Mm -hmm. And that was for me and for some of my crewmates, and we had a lot of discussion about this in the post-flight debriefings, um, that we realized that, no, we're not doing here a high-tech live action role play. We're doing the real thing here. This is preparing what can be considered the largest, most ambitious, furthest journey we've ever undertaken as a society. And we're in a damn privileged situation to be part of this. And the realization we had was this is nothing abstract. It's actually literally palpable because the stars are dancing 10 centimeters from your visor. And so to some extent, I would say Mars, to some extent, is within us. This is what I was talking about. He is a Martian. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one important aspect that you need to consider as society is that I am sure that to adventure to Mars is very risky. No, as I mentioned before in the medical uh, area, it is really a huge challenge. But we need to put in perspective, if we go back in time and go to the 1400s or before that, people were adventuring with uh, in ships or, or horses even before that. And, uh, so the risk is there. 
No, and we know, maybe we know more now today about the risk, and we have a, a different, let's say, ethical or moral code for this type of adventure. But uh, I mean, it's going to get to a point where we are either we take the risk, and or we don't go, because uh, uh, I just heard that maybe in 2040 or 2060, with the pace that medicine or the health area of uh, space missions uh, is, has been evolving, we are going to take much longer than that. I can assure you. I, I, I mentioned at first that when I was presenting somehow the risks of, uh, or the medical risks of a trip to Mars, that we know much more now, but for sure you know that we don't know enough. And every time that we find uh, uh, something else, you know, in terms of the, 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 the health of male or female astronauts and so on, we, 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 it puts her further away from Mars, not closer to Mars. Because there is a huge new area that uh, appears in front of the scientists and the doctors and so on. So it is, uh, it, I think that we are going to have to create a balance in terms of knowledge and risk, and uh, and um, we cannot. I'm not uh, even talking about the, the ships in the 1400s, but even when we went to the moon in 1969, we knew much, much less than we know now. Much less in terms of medicine, I can assure you, and in terms of technology as well. Somehow we took the risk. So this is something that it has to to, to be somehow. Um, we have to ruminate that somehow and, and, and start thinking, uh, can we take this risk? Can we be, uh, can, can we have the courage? Can, are we strong enough to do that? Because there will be never a precise uh, moment in the area of medicine that will say, okay, it's safe now to go. Or if it happens, it, everybody here will be dead because it's going to be 100 years from now. You have to remember that Gagarin went into space in 1961, 61 years ago. We have so many doubts. We don't know a lot. This field, and I, I've been in this area for over 30 years. So what I'm saying now, believe me, it is true. We don't know anything. We, we have a... a an idea of what happens to the mind and the body in space. And the, this is particular to astronauts that were selected, trained, and they were very health and fit individuals. I always, I have this joke that now with the space tourism coming in, and we are gonna have old people, young people, sick people, you know, people taking mm -hmm. medications, uh, you no know, chronic diseases. Now space medicine is starting. Till now, it was the uh, acclimatization, adaptation of humans in a different environment. So health individuals in a, in a different environment. It's a completely different scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think that, as I'm saying now, and I will say that in 20 years' time if I'm alive, possibly not, and 40 years' time for sure not, <laughs> it is we are not going to get to this stage. As I believe that the the... the, the the crews from the ships in 1400s or before that were not also sure. They, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what was, uh, well, when they, they, they discovered Brazil in 1500s, they didn't know that there was land there. No, they, they were risking. So maybe some point in time we need, need to take the risk. And I think that the moon can solve some problems. And I'm, as I say again, it was a pity that we lost five decades of living on the moon, working on the moon, dealing with psychological issues, with architecture, geology, everything. You no, know, all these in, these areas that must be integrated to make sure that humans can successfully live our planet and live in space or whatever. Thank you. So, Nicolas Romain, do you have any surprises that that you still feel uh, related to Mars that you experienced? I uh, I would say I truly hope that the first person setting the foot of Mars on Mars is already born. I really hope that 
because that would mean that uh, irrespective of the decade uh, when it will happen is that we have someone uh, that has a future to go there. And I think in the current situation, it's really important to, to, to go back to space and to say, look, we can do it. Um, we send one people there, but we have thousands of people supporting it back on Earth. We have uh, countries, we have uh, societies around the world motivated to have this person to, that will be taking all these risks and that the rewards will go beyond the individual, uh, even by, by motivating young people to study STEM. You know, now look at the younger generation. We have, we have really to show them that uh, there's a future, it can be positive. So that, that's really what I'm hoping with, uh, with ex space exploration. And um, I really like uh, what my uh, predecessor just uh, said with the example of medicines or, or saying that uh, exploration towards Brazil was difficult. But most of these, you know, endeavors, uh, the great explorers, you know, uh, circumvent navigation of the earth, uh, discovering new lands, they were done because you had individuals in leadership position that were either deciding upon themselves to develop the technology, Henry the Navigator in Portugal, or sponsoring Columbus uh, travel. So what we, for me, we really need to have the people that have the dream to go there, but we need, so that's, you need to be courageous, but you need also to have leaders that are courageous to take the decision to understand why we need to do it. So we need, in fact, a lot of courage to go to Mars. And uh, I really hope that, uh, that we have both, both the people, the first one that will set the foot on the moon and the one that will take the decision, political decision, these two courageous people that are already there. And Romain, do you, do you want to add something as a summary? Well, well, that's hard to add something to what that was just said, but uh, uh, I truly believe that we are entering a new phase in space, in space exploration. You know, before that, there was only, let's say, the main space agencies, NASA, Roscosmos. Now we have many new space agencies entering the race. We have the UAE, India is going to enter the race. China has entered the race. And I remember I had a, a, a talk with some astronaut uh, uh, from uh, the Apollo program, and they were discussing uh, the, the, rise, the, the rise of China uh, for, for the lunar settlements, the lunar exploration. Uh, as great Americans, they were like, we won't let them be the first one to go back. We won't let them to be the first ones to, to create a settlement. So I believe that if there is, let's say, a new opportunity for the US to show that they will be the first one to create a settlement, it may be sooner than later, especially with the new private companies that can play a role in that and speed up the processes in the governmental agencies just like it's the case with SpaceX, but maybe we'll have many new more in the future. Uh, but, but what I would like to say maybe uh, more related to rovers uh, that could be of interest for the audience is, um, you know, working on rovers, well, it was a dream coming true for me when I was a child. I was dreaming of like, oh, I want to work on Curiosity. And it came true. And, uh, you know, it was a super big surprise to, well, you could imagine that, but it was a surprise to see that, you know, all the teams working all together to make sure that such a complex system works perfectly fine, millions and millions of kilometers away, uh, targeting rocks that are a few centimeters uh, long, or wide, or thick. It's extremely wonderful. And I felt like it was an orchestra, you know, like many different orchestras from all over the world working all together with the same purpose. And I hope it will stay the same for uh, colonizing, colonizing Mars. Thank you. Can I just mm -hmm. f final remark? Just like a final, final <laughs> remark. Yeah. You no, know, uh, just talking about, I, I agree very much with was, uh, what was said, that we need a leader or someone that uh, is uh, strong enough you know, to take the risk. But over centuries now, from the beginning of uh, mankind possibly till now, we have these leaders that send people to war. And these people are going to war, possibly to die. So I don't understand sometimes why it's um, so difficult to take the risk to, for something that is possibly making mankind a more, let's say, a, co a cosmic species. And we can send our young men and women to war. 
without uh, considering the risk, possibly, I don't know, <laughs> because these people might not come back home. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, uh, it is uh, double standards in this sense. You know? The politicians are so keen, in, uh, or the leaders, <coughs> not just now happening wars, but for all our history. So we are able to take the risks, and I think that they are, they, there is no interest, basically. <laughs> So well, by this we came back uh, from from the, from Mars to our Earth Earthy problems. So, <laughs> thank you very much for a very fruitful discussion. For, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, and it was really a pleasure to be uh, in this group. And uh, yeah, and hopefully to see you all uh, somehow soon. And uh, have a good time. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. On the Mars. On the Mars. <laughs> <laughs>